Hey there YouTube, welcome back to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob, Solo Gamer. I call myself a Solo Gamer because I enjoy solo RPG games as well as recently solo board games. And in this video, we're going to talk about Fallout. Now, <clears throat> before we get into the game, review here and talk about the game if it's right for you. A couple disclaimers are going to get out of the way first. First and foremost, all of the thing you see here is my own hard-earned money that I pie these game systems with and I enjoy the game. So therefore I can give you a brutally honest review and tell you what I really think and not have some corporate overlord over me at that point twisting my arm to deliver what they want you to hear. Second of all, if you like my video, click the like button. And if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button, click the little bell icon, and at that point you will be notified every time I upload a new video. So let's jump right on into it and let's talk about solo board games. So on Kickstarter you see this, and now this is made by Fantasy Flight Games. We see these board games coming out that say solo play and you were starting to notice this is becoming more than a trend it's becoming pretty well commonplace now in a lot of game systems out there but do they all deliver on what they say is being a game that can have endless possibilities and replayability do they really deliver or are we buying a game strictly on the awesome art that they use to draw us in to only become basically a burden on our pocketbook and a dust collector for our shelf. Let's find out and jump into it. So Fallout, if you're not familiar with Fallout, which I'm going to assume the majority of you out there watching this are. So if you've ever played the video game Fallout, you understand that you are a survivor in a post-apocalyptic world after nuclear war. Assuming that it's Earth, I can only assume, and that's what I gathered from playing the game, that it's Earth after a nuclear fallout. And of course, scattered across the world, there's all kinds of mutations from all the radiological fallout, hence the name Fallout, that has mutated not only human but also animals and other things into these hideous type of creatures which, let's face it, aren't so friendly and they want to kill you. So everybody has a pretty good idea of what Fallout is. And if not, give it a check it out. If you got a, any type of game console or computer you should check out some of the original Fallout games and they are pretty interesting. Now they are pretty lengthy because the thing about Bethesda Studios, if you've ever played Skyrim or Fallout, is that they pay very close attention to their game settings and they're very vast and they can take a long time to actually complete. I can personally say that I have never completed any of the video games or even like Skyrim just because it does not hold my attention for that long and at that point, I find something else to do, and really, my heart's really into tabletop gaming. Electronic gaming at that point does kind of, how do I put it, um, fill the void when I'm bored, but majority of time, I'm tabletop gaming. So, in the game Fallout, and the first thing you're going to get, I have had this game less than 24 hours, and I've already played it six times. And the first thing we're going to come to is to learn to play. And when you thumb through this, you're going to quickly uh, learn that on the first page, when you look at the V-Rat, which is actually the dashboard for your survivor, you're going to notice the word special. Those represent your abilities for your survival. And those are strength, perception, at the endurance, charisma, intelligence, agility, and luck and those are really important to remember because as we go through I'm going to explain to you why those are important so the cool thing is you already have that feeling right there with the abilities of an RPG game and this is a 
how do I put this, a common theme that I notice is very prevalent in this game and it really does make it feel more like an RPG game in my opinion than a board game. And let's get into the character, um, I keep calling them characters, they're not characters, I call them survivors. And so throughout the video, if I keep saying character, really I mean survivor. It's hard for me to try to classify it as survivor and not character. So of your five survivors, you get to choose from five different selections. And that would be, you can be a brotherhood outcast, you could be a super mutant, or a vault dweller, a wastelander, or ghoul. Now with that, with the five cards, your starting cards that you choose with, you also get to accompany with them five 28 millimeter scale miniatures that are really, really freaking cool. Let me hold that up there so you can see it. This guy is just badass. And of course they have five other miniatures that go with it to accompany with your cards and to go with your V-Rat. Now, with your V-Rat, you also, if you notice, you have these pegs. This one represents your radiation level, this one represents your hit point level, and then the gray one at the top is your XP level. So let's start with the gray one. Every time you complete a quest, or you engage in battle with one of the many enemies on the board, you get XP. You take those points, and at that point, you advance along your special counter here. Once your XP comes back to the starting point, you level up. You, at that point, draw two tokens, which you get a lot of tokens, and then you fill in your abilities at that point, and you get something that looks like that, and then at that point, you unlock that ability. Now how the abilities work is at times you rely on your abilities for quests and for combat. Without them, you get to roll the die once. But with them, you get to pull on your abilities and because you have that ability, you can re-roll your die once, altering the outcome, which gives you the upper hand in the situation. So, one other thing I'm going to mention about this V-Rat. You see these two bottom pegs. This is your radiation. So every time you enter an area on the game board that has radiation, you move up one. Or there's also other scenarios in which you may encounter radiation that may cause you to accumulate radiation. Now, same thing with your hit points. As you take damage, your hit point counter starts going down. At any time, should your hit point counter and your radiation counter at that point be equal, your character at that point respawns at the starting point without any gear or armor. Your hit points are replenished to full, but the radiation stays. Once the radiation builds all the way up to where your max hit point counter is, at that point your character is dead and out of the game. So pretty simple how to understand how that works out. Now as far as the game goes, the game goes in a sequence of turns. Um, actually turns, I should say. And there are six different options that you can do. Now you're only allowed to do two things on your turn. And you have to make a decision of what you want to do. Now, on your turn, you can explore and unlock different parts of the map, or you can choose to move your character around the map into different areas, or you can do a quest, which I'll get into the quest here in a minute, or at that point you can do an encounter, and I will explain encounters more as well. You can choose to fight, or you can choose to camp. Now, let's talk about these six things in order. So explore. When your character explores at that point, your map is going to have one of two tiles. 
Now, of course, there are going to be key area tiles, what I call, consider a key area tile. They're reversible, and it's where your character always starts, such as Crossroads Camp. But the rest of your tiles, which are shuffled and then assembled to create the game board, will have these two symbols. This one indicating that there is danger, you should be cautious, and this one is, it is very dangerous and you have to proceed with extreme caution. So as your character moves to an unexplored edge of the map and you explore at that point, the tile would turn over showing you all the geological features on it and sorry about that, some of the symbols that it has to show. If you look right here, it'll show you the encounter or the enemy. This is your encounter. This is your enemy. Now, if you notice, if you look at the tile, how you have these lines that run through it, what those represent is how your character moves through that particular tile. So if your character has two movement points and they wanted to move from the Pendleton estate to this area, that would cost them one, two, three, okay, to give you an idea. But if you notice the red outline, which means it's a difficult terrain at that point, it costs two movement points to move one space. Typically when you look at just the white movement spaces like this, it only costs one. So at that point, you can move and explore the map and open that up. Or you can move with inside the tile you're already on and at that point go to an encounter. Now the encounters are broken up into two different categories depending on the symbol. So there's two symbols represented across all the tile boards in the game. This one representing the settlement and this one representing ruins. And depending on which one you choose, you choose a card off the top of the deck, flip it over, read the caption, and at that caption it's going to explain the scenario to you and give you one of two options to choose from. You choose that option and at that point you'd read the text below it, follow what it tells you to do, and sometimes you just make a simple decision and it'll take you to another area of the board or you let the luck of the die determine the outcome. One of two things can happen out of that. A, you can uh, gain some wealth out of that, or B, you can come face to face with danger. Now, the other thing is questing. When you first set up your game, your game comes with four scenario cards in it. And when you look at the scenario card and you turn it over on the back, it's going to show you how to lay out the map. You lay out the map according to this, and then at the top, it's going to give you card numbers. Now, they give you two large stacks of quest cards. They all go in numerical order. You go in there, draw in your cards to build the main quest. Now, as you start to quest out, What's happening in the background of the story that you are part of is there are two warring factions. One that's represented by a red star and the other one that's represented by a blue shield. And on the other side of your scenario card here, you'll notice there's this counter. They both start up here. Now depending on how uh, the decisions you make in the quest, the luck of the die rolls, and then of course the agenda cards that are pulled will ultimately decide how the markers are moved along this scale. The first faction marker to reach the red one at that point wins the game. Now when you start the quest out at that point you have to make a decision as to which faction you at that point align yourself with and how they do that is really cool so in this scenario I'm gonna read this question to you I'll let you viewers out there decide and you'll see how this works out 
So this one is called Welcome to Far Harbor. A sickly green fog has spread across much of the island. Every structure you pass has been abandoned, but you see dangerous looking shapes moving in the mists. You could, one, the fog calls to you, travel into the mist, and let it embrace you. Or option two, the strange machines are the only sign of civilization left on this island. Investigate them. So, what would you do? Would you walk into the green fog and embrace it? If you agreed to do that, then at that point, you would side with the blue shield. If you decided to investigate the machines that are operating the last signs of civilization, at that point, you would side yourself with the red star. Now, would you start the game out and as the quest moves along, as you complete the quest objective, it's going to give you a series of other cards to complete the quest. That quest keeps running throughout the game from the scenario. And through the encounter cards, these are more or less like smaller side quests that at that point will give you how do I put this? More options of the story, make it more, the story more in depth, and give you an opportunity to find more loot. So, the other thing that you can choose to do on your turn, on the one of the two things, is fight. Now, the battle matrix of this system is extremely simple. You get three dice. All three dice at that point let me get this a little closer to the camera to show you. We'll represent a certain part of the body depending on what it is. And I mean, it's you look at them, it's just common sense stuff. It's nothing really too hard to pick up on. Now, if you notice down here, there's this what looks like a little cog wheel right there. That's one point. And then if we roll over here, you can see how there's two points. So now, depending on the enemy you're going to fight, there's enemies that have to be in the same um, space, occupy the same space as you're in, which we consider melee. At that point, you can do battle. Others actually have weapons and have range, and they can be one space away from you and still engage you in battle. And let's use two different examples here. This is a rad scorpion. If we take a look here, you can see where you have to roll on the dice you have to have one point to kill the rad scorpion. And then over here in this corner of the box, it gives you these little symbols, which really aren't hard to learn. You just go to them, these two symbols represent, one, the little lightning bolt tells you that this is a very aggressive enemy, and it's always gonna try to attack you if it's in the same area. The arrow means if at any point you go to attack it and you miss, this enemy is going to retreat because it's somewhat cowardice and it's not going to stay the fight. Unlike this bounty hunter right here, if you take a look at this guy, so it's going to take two points to kill him and they outline right here the specific parts that you have to hit in order to take him out. Now what you'll notice here looks like a little sack. That's actually what they consider trash, and at that point is their loot cards. You would draw a card if you defeat him, and then at the bottom you see what looks like a little gun. That means he's ranged. Now, you get this small stack of these loot cards with the game. And of course, as you draw the cards, on, depending on quests that you complete, or enemies that you defeat, you get cards. The cards at that point can be traded in at the store for more Nuka-Cola tokens that they use in the game to upgrade your weapon and armor. Which is one thing I can say I really like about this game is the fact that at that point through questing you acquire money and defeating enemies and then you can use that money to really detail your character to the way that you want it through weapons and armor and which gives you an upper advantage overall in the game. 
So now aside of fighting, you can camp. And like I said, when you camp, there's stipulations to camping. With camping, you can't camp if there is an enemy on the same tile as you. It just doesn't work. You have to be on a tile by yourself. And at that point, you can camp. When you do camp, you recover three hit points. Also, one of the things that you pick up along the way that you find in your loot is you come across companion cards. And here's one we're going to use for an example. I'll hold it up to the camera so you can get a view of it. And this is Preston Garvey. As you can see there. Now let's read what Preston Garvey does. Preston Garvey um, exhausts to ignore the effects of difficult terrain until the end of your turn. Now going back to what I explained about terrain earlier, you would turn him, which would be 90 degrees to show that he's exhausted, and then at that point, any terrain feature that has outlined red, which is difficult terrain, you ignore and you count as one space. Now, he would remain at that point exhausted until you went to camp. At that point, when you camp, he would unexhaust and you would be able to use him again, but not all companions work that way. So there's certain stipulations on the cards that you have to read that actually add more into this game. For example, with Preston Garvey here. So if there is not a a Vault 84 or a Vault 109 deck card, keep this companion when it on exhaust. So right there tells you if any of those deck cards are in the play, 84 or 109, once he's exhausted, he's done and you'd lose him. But if not, you get to keep him and reuse him later on. Now, aside of your loot cards, you can also do some shopping. Now, there's specific areas of the map that you hit that allow you to access the store. And this is really when you get to upgrade. Now, when you get to the store, you're given two decks of cards. You have this deck, which represents your basic overall general merchandise that you can purchase, such as a sniper rifle for 10 caps, and during a fight, results any result um, of a wound to the head always inflicts a hit on the enemy. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, or you can buy yourself a hazmat suit during a test that uses endurance at one hit. Each time you suffer a radiation, suffer one fewer because of your radiation suit. And those are your basically your typical items that you can buy. Or at that point, what I like to do with my game is when I do visit the store, is I'll use three of the regular I'll draw because I recommend four cards when you visit the store. I'll draw three of the common, and then I'll draw one uncommon, put them face down, and make my decision. And of course, in the uncommon cards, this is where you get to the really big bad weapons. And at that point, um, we have right here which costs us 11 caps. It's called the Fat Man. And before a fight, you test at that point your L, which would be your luck. So you would roll these bad boys. If you have a 3, you fail and you cannot spend on rerolls. But if you succeed during a fight, when you kill an enemy, kill one other enemy of equal or lower level within one space of the initial enemy that you killed. So as you can see, there's a lot of random chance to this game that will alter things. Now the last deck of cards that they do give you are these right here. Which, these are your ability cards. So if you remember in the beginning I talked about your VRAT. So when you level up at that you choose two tokens if you choose two tokens and those tokens at well, I'm going to use an example are E and L which I already have those tokens go back into the pile and then at that point you draw a card that is equal to an ability you already have so I'm going to use E here which this is called lead belly and you discard to recover all of your radiation 
that would go with the V-Rat and then after it's used it would be discarded and go back into the pile to be used at a later time. That is pretty much the overall actions that you can use on your turn. So, on your turn you get to choose one of two. You can either explore, move, quest, encounter, fight, or camp. After you have done that, at that point, an agenda card is drawn. You draw the agenda card, and then when you look at it, the agenda card not only advances the um, warring factions that are going on behind the scenes and that you are part of, but it also tells you what enemies activate on the board. And when you hold them up and you look at that, and you look at them little icons at the bottom, it tells you that an insect is coming into play and that you're going to gain one point advancing. So, with this, you're going to get plus one for every single point that they have advanced on the game board. And of course, how they advance is through the quest, through the story. Completing those quests at that point you get rewards and at that point that token would advance further down the time tracker This card at that point would be done and then it would move on to the enemy now with the enemy you would match up at that point The symbol on the token and any open tile on the game board that that token would match up to example here at that point the token goes on there flipped up showing that that creature is active now if there was already a token flipped up on there and you were to draw that same symbol again at that point that token moves one space closer to your character now the one thing to remember any area of the map that is undiscovered when that token goes to move, it counts the undiscovered area as one movement. So, this is DAI essentially of the game. And when you draw it, all these creatures activate and they start moving closer to your guy where he is on the board. You take that and think about as you're completing the quest. The quest at that point is going to have you to move to various parts of the board to complete different areas of the quest in which you are going to in, at that point and come to encounters that you're going to have to resolve all in all it really does encompass like a role-playing game for a board game and it does have a lot of replayability to it like i said i've had this game for less than 24 hours and i've already played it six times and it's a very very good game now, when i just given you the brief overview of how the game works, of course, after the enemies go, at that point, it would be your turn again, and you get to choose one of those two things you wanted to do, and it just keeps flowing along like that. And ultimately, just as I explained, once your token's first token to get down here, wins the game. I'm sorry, I had the card upside down. Once the token gets down here into the red, that faction wins, and essentially wins the game. Now, when you go through the book, of course, they you know give you all these demonstrations of how the move action works and you know blah 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 blah. And then once you get towards the back of the book, which is the last page, they overview this little area for solo play. So I read through it. Now there's a couple of things in here that I do like that I kept in, and then there's one thing in here that I got rid of. I did not like it. And I'm going to read these to you so you may understand why, especially for you solo players out there. When playing Fallout Solo, follow all the standard rules for the game with the following exceptions. 1. When a quest requires you to be in the same space as another survivor. This is the part I do not understand because if you're playing the solo, you're playing one character, so there's only one survivor on the board. But I guess you could play two survivors if you wanted to, which would make sense. Anyway, when a quest requires you to be in the same space as another survivor, 
you must be in a settlement space, which one of these guys, if you look right here, to me it looks like a bus, but that's supposed to be a building or a settlement representation in, another, in a space instead. If it requires the other survivor to make a test, they are assumed to have a result of three. So, to put it in a nutshell, if you're required to do a test to one survivor, you both have to be on settlement, and before you even roll your dice, it's assumed that your other survivor already has a result of three. So you have to roll a four or better. So, that right there, um, does add some actually it adds a lot of challenge into the game particularly solo two when resolving encounter cards read them yourself now this rule to me is kind of moronic and i don't even understand why they even put this in the book but evidently they had to so when you go to resolve an encounter card what they want you to do is read the caption and um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this card to you so you get an idea of what they're talking about. As you pick through the ruins, you spot a figure on the ground. As you approach, you see that it is a dead man. He has no weapons or gear. What was he doing out here? Question mark. You have one of two options to choose from. You can investigate the corpse or two, you can ignore the corpse and search the area. Now what they're talking about is they're saying... Don't read the card entirely, the outcomes, read this to yourself out loud to make your decision. I don't understand why they would have to put that in there. I think that's a given, and most people who play games solo, you know, we're not stupid people. I think we would have already gathered that. The third rule, which is the rule that I left out and I pulled out and I just completely did not agree with it, was this one. When the agenda deck is depleted, which is this, so as you take your turns and you draw these cards, once the card is out, the last card is drawn, at that point they say the deck is depleted. So when the agenda deck is depleted, advance only the power token for the faction that currently has less power. If the factions are tied for power, they both advance as normal. Okay, this is the part I don't agree with. So you play this solo, you go through the quest, and through the luck of the die, and the decisions you had made, has put your faction at that point further ahead in the time tracker. But according to their solo rules, if the AI's time tracker is further behind, you should advance them further. I did not agree with that rule for solo play. And that's the one rule that I just admitted out of it. I I played with it, I played two games and used it, and I didn't agree with it because I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute, you know, it's the luck of my die and it's my decision making through the quest, running back and forth through this map, killing all these enemies that's gotten me to where I'm at, and now I'm just going to give the turn marker over to the other faction side. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? So I omitted that rule. Now. I have to admit, the game is pretty cool. The map is pretty cool. And when you set the map up, of course, you have your um, features on one side. And like if you look at this one, this is heavily uh, radiated. So if your character was to step into this green area, you take one radiation point. This area is clear, but you can obviously see the enemies that you'll encounter there. And there is one settlement there. Now, these are all different. You set these down, and at that point you shuffle them up. You build the map according to the way that the scenario chart shows you, and every time it's a different map when you play, which is really cool. But what I found myself focusing on, and what I thought was really, really cool, and I played a game last night, and it lasted quite a while, but I finally did achieve the quest. And they give you two large decks of quest cards. And when I say large, I mean large decks of quest cards. Here, you know, 
boom, these babies right here. So every time you go through the quest and you answer that question and you make the decision, at that point, it's going to give you one, two, or possibly upwards to three other card numbers it tells you to go to to continue through the quest. Now, all the cards are in numerical order, so it's very easy to find them. You pull them out, and then just like you did in the beginning when I read this to you and you all decided which side of the faction you were on, you follow the story through, which will take you through the map, take you through some sticky situations, and once again, luck of the die. And I found that to be very, very cool. And it was like a role-playing game. At that point, you're more immersed in the story then you are at that point of the whole entire agenda thing that's going on. Who's going to win, the Red Star or the Blue Shield, you know? And that's another way that you can reuse this and play this game, which is really, really awesome. And it's an aspect that I really enjoyed, and I can foresee myself at that point using a lot. And on top of that, incorporating some of these ideas into solo RPGs. And heck, why not? You can use these quest items and you can create some pretty wild characters off of using a D20 system for role playing and reusing the map along with those and have some pretty cool RPGs. It's getting a little off course. So, all in all, I said I would rate this game and talk about it and be brutally honest about it. And we're getting to that point of game. I mean, I pretty much showed you how you set the game map up. The game map is pretty um, simple. I mean, you get these and you arrange them to create the map on the scenario cards. I like that. I like the fact that they're pretty durable, thick card stock, and um, they're not cheap. That's a plus too. The one thing I hate about the system and my biggest complaint about the system are the freaking cards. Why would you give me normal size cards like these that I can handle and use, but then you give me a bunch of these small, ridiculous little itty bitty cards that have a tendency, A, hard to manage and keep in a playing area, and I have a large table I'm playing on here, and even those become a pain in the butt but on top of that, you're going to give me four, actually five decks of these things of different things to be able to keep track of on the game and utilize. To me, it would have made more sense to just make larger cards like this to make it more easier to manage. And that, I don't like that. And I've said that before, I don't like trading card games, I don't like collectible card games, I don't like any of those because the thing I don't like about card games is you tend to spend more time fidgeting with cards than you do really, at that point, the game. And so I hate card games, I hate anything to do with them. So that aspect took this game down a few points for me, just for the cards, but not the replayability. I would have to say, as a solo game, does this game actually deliver for the solo RPG player and keep you, at that point, engaged with the world and with what you're playing? I will say yes. That's a thumbs up towards the way I look at this game and how I will review it. The other thing that um, I think could have made this game far better is... The tokens are pretty cool, and it does keep, I have to admit, a certain amount of surprise to the enemies, because you don't know when you flip it over what you're going to encounter. I thought that was pretty cool, but the one thing uh, I think would have been better is at that point if they would have actually incorporated some more miniatures into it. They give you these five great detailed miniatures that are awesome. They're very awesome. And I don't even think they really had to have done that. They could have probably went with tokens like this to save money, but the fact that they put these in here is a plus two, which just shows you um, that's really cool. And these can be used, like I said, if you do decide to do an RPG, you already got your character token right here. Now, the other thing that I thought was really cool was the dashboard. 
uh, the dashboard, you know, playing the video game, it's really cool that they did this. I mean, this is, you know, it's cool, and there's no, there's no denying that. Um, and the dashboard's cool. I wish they would have found some other way to be able to keep these little cards more organized with your dashboard, but hey, what have you. The other complaint that I have about the game are these little freaking tokens. And this is the first thing I noticed. You get a bunch of these little tokens. And even on a surface like this, this is an oak table, when you try to go grab these things, you know, they have a tendency to shoot across the table, fall on the floor, and get everywhere else. And it kind of makes it a pain in the butt. And it's just another one of those things um, with game systems that I rakes up there with cards that I just absolutely hate. I hate when ugh, that type of stuff that just drives you bonkers and it makes a mess. And then you're constantly having to find bags to keep all these freaking small little tokens in and keep them together. And Lord help you if you lose the wrong one, then at that point, your game is kind of disadvantaged at that point. So I think that's enough griping what I don't like about the game system. Um, what I really do like about it is the replayability. I have to admit, like I said, they really did come through at actually capturing the feel of Fallout from the video game to a board game. And I, you know, that, that unto itself is um, a thumbs up for me right there. Now, depending on where you look, I happened to buy this copy on a Black Friday sale on Amazon for about 25 bucks. And normally it retails for about $47 and I've even seen it higher depending on where you go to shop. Obviously, um, you know, if you're a smart shopper, you're going to look around and you're going to find places that are running sales to get it a little cheaper. Or I guess you could walk into um, a local game shop and try to purchase this. But at that point, I'm sure they're going to tack a few bucks on just having it on their shelf and the convenience of you walking in and spend your money. But is it worth it? So that's what you're asking me. Artichoke, is this game really worth it? It is worth it. And it does deliver on its promise for a solo game experience. And at that point, it is immersive. And you really can get into this game. And it has a high amount of replayability to it with the scenarios changing. The thing I don't like and I hope to see in the future is that they have more scenarios. Because with this game, you get four scenarios. So even though your decisions, your quest that you make will alter the game system and the constant changing map will change everything on it. It still only leaves you with four. So maybe in the future we'll see some expansions giving you some more game scenarios to go with and some more terrain tiles to go with it as well. I guess we'll have to wait and see what that does. So adding all this stuff up, where would I rate this for me? To make my opinion on it for you guys out there to decide if you want this for your game table or not. So replayability. I'm going to say replayability right there rates it way high. I'm going to say that puts it like up around an 8 for me, an 8 out of 10. The, the fact that you had these quests and it's like a RPG game and you can really get into it. You know that bumps it up even more. That takes it up to like about an 8 out of 10. The fact that you get these cool 28 millimeter miniatures with it that are so detailed and the work that they put into it at that point takes me up to, I'm going to say a 9 out of 10. But the one thing that just takes the numbers down are all these ridiculous cards, just these small cards that just get everywhere. And then I just can't bring myself to, I love this game, don't get me wrong. And the cards are just one thing that I just don't like about the game. So at that point, I'm going to say 
my personal rating, I'm going to give this game 9 out of 10. I'm going to knock it down one peg just because of the cards. I just don't like the cards. And I know other people out there who enjoy card games may love this system for the fact that you have so many cards that you need probably another entire table to put them all to organize them. But for me, I would rather have a either a larger card to be able to manage and you know utilize or perhaps something a little bit different um, kind of like with this um, you have your these small deck of cards of your rare items and then you have your common items right so you know, I think they could have done that differently, combined it maybe into one deck, and maybe changed something on the front of this. You know, this isn't a rare item, this is a common item, and it would have saved on one deck of cards. But, anyways, all in all, guys, this game really does deliver on what it talks about. Solo play, absolutely. And unlike some other games that I have played that. <coughs> talk about solo replayability and I'm going to use zombie side as an example here so zombie side even though one player utilizing force um, survivors at that point can play that game the one thing about zombie side is you go through the booklet and you're given the scenarios and the maps to build out of there but the maps never change the maps remain the same and as you know, anybody that's played Zombie Side, you at that point try to fight off the hordes of undead to achieve the objectives, and then at that point exit the map to win. <coughs> so that type of system kind of does leave. How do I put this? After a few game sessions, it leaves you wanting more out of the game, whereas if this game really does deliver it. This game really does change things up, give you different question options, and really does leave stuff up to your decision making and the spirit and luck of the die to determine an outcome. So I think with all of that, I think I have given this game system a fair review. So a 9 out of 10 is pretty dang good in my book, and for me to give this a 9 out of 10, I really do enjoy this game system a lot. And with that being said, guys, I think I'm going to end this video here. If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Click the bell icon, and you're going to be notified of my uh, most latest video that I put out. Now, with that being said, I think I'm going to go scrounge up some uh, Thanksgiving leftovers, and uh, I'm going to get into another game of Fallout. All right, guys. Game on, my friends. Always look forward to hearing from you and for my new subscribers out there. Welcome. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for supporting me and all my other subscribers that have been with me from the beginning. You guys know who you are out there. Thank you so much. I hope to move forward and I hope to gain more subscribers and be able to get more game systems and to talk about them to keep you guys informed. So when you guys decide to go out and buy that game system, make a decision as to whether it's the right one for you and you're not getting a dust collector. All right, guys. Talk to you later. Artichoke dip. Out.